Greetings from Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry, and I'm so excited that I've got peaches for the first time off of this dwarf peach tree in the Potager. I didn't think I'd get any peaches off this tree because its pollinator actually died last year, and this requires pollination. I don't know where it got the pollination from, but it certainly did produce some beautiful, fat, and luscious and sweet peaches here. Really, really thrilled about it. Flowers, if I could choose just one crop to grow in Hopalong Hollow, it would be fruit, because fruit is really what I love more than any other sort of vegetation that you eat. And it's the thing that I have the most trouble with growing. I don't know, does a peach get any more perfect than that? And it just rained on these peaches. And they're so great to eat right now because they're so fresh. And we're having a very special tea today. So I think we will incorporate these wonderful peaches into our lunch because we're going to have a very special subject today. A wonderful American author, illustrator, and very interesting woman. So I'm going to pick all of them. By the way, this is a Reliance peach. It's a dwarf peach tree, and it doesn't get much taller than 10 foot tall. Wow. I hope you'll indulge me just a few more seconds to boast about my beautiful peaches. I don't have a lot to boast about this year in the uh, fruit department and the food department in the garden, because the potager was really not very productive for us so far this year. Tomatoes are looking good, the squash is looking good, but the broccoli is getting eaten up, the cabbages are getting devoured. Ah, <sighs> oh my goodness. But these peaches, now this is something to be proud of. And another amazing thing is that this tree is only a year old. And it, being a dwarf, it doesn't take up much space in your garden. If you just want to put one in the corner of your potager, it's just so beautiful to have fruit growing among the vegetables and the flowers and the roses. So think about that. Oh my goodness, what can I do with all these peaches? Mm. Well, we weren't nearly as successful in collecting blueberries today as we were in collecting peaches, but there's enough here to make our recipe for the day. Just look at my little hens. <laughs> they have grown so much. I invited them into the potager so they could eat those worms off the broccoli. You had to go, girls. You get those little slugs and bugs out of here, okay? Come over here and get these cabbage worms. I've got some nice squash coming up here. Mm. I guess anybody can grow squash, right? <laughs> I do have to sadly report though that my sweet peas that I was so I was so excited about, well, they just shriveled up and died. It just got too hot for them. And so I guess next year I better plant them a little earlier. Naturally the flowers are just doing gangbusters. But <laughs> These um, rutabagia are just getting ready to open. <sighs> Fortunately, can't eat those. The hollyhocks that I planted from seed, they're looking good. They will be so, so lovely next year. This year they probably won't do much. One of you were so kind to send me some black hollyhock seeds. And I did plant them over here. And look at this. These are... These are going to be great. I have pink ones and black ones right here growing. So they should be looking great next year. Why is when I come out here and cut these heads off the elephant garlic. And the only reason I actually plant the elephant garlic is for these ornamental seed heads. They're just beautiful to use in fly, uh, dried flower arrangements and in vases. So I go around the garden looking at all the alliums that um, would look beautiful for dried flowers. And these are usually the, <laughs> the most spectacular ones. 
favorite bulbs to plant for dried flower arrangements and for vases is the drumstick allium. And this is a, a bulb that we plant in the fall. And I like to leave them in till about mid-July when they start to form these seed heads on the top. They're really past their beautiful deep purple color. But they're still very, very attractive. But I like to leave them in for quite a while because the bees really love these. But these make great, great, great dried flowers. And the nice thing also is they actually multiply underground like many, many bulbs do. So every year you'll get a few more. So even after you've gathered these, blossoms and seed heads, the honeybees, the bumblebees and the butterflies will still gather on these if you leave them outside in a vase or you just hang them upside down on your porch to dry. They'll still get a lot of use out of them and that's a good thing. Another thing that I can collect in August are the peacock feathers because they begin to drop their feathers in July and they leave them all over the yard. These are just the ones that I picked up this morning. And a lot of people are familiar with the eye feathers, but peacocks also have many other beautiful feathers, such as these wonderful rust feathers, and then these lovely stripy things. So I like to add these in vases too, and it looks like I've got quite a nice collection here to make a beautiful vase for our table setting today. See that this Peabody boy has lost his tail feathers and he's already starting a new set. As we're headed toward the lavender, I wanted to show you this wonderful old sink that my friend gave me. This is a really small cast iron sink. She said she'd had it sitting out in her barn for the last 30 years or so and she still hadn't done anything with it, so she gave it to me, knowing that I will find some use for it. So it's in pretty rough condition on the inside. Cast iron, very small. Um, I love the size of it, actually. And I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to do with this? Now, I've already got my large cast iron sink in my potting bench, so I don't need another one of those. But maybe a smaller one at the back of the house might be appropriate, and this would be perfect just needs um, a stand and a little restoration work. What do you think? If this was yours, what would you do with it? So this lavender is past its prime pretty much for picking. If I were to wanted to dry it and use it for sachets or just dried lavender, and really this should have been picked just as the flower buds were opening, but they're going to seed now and they really aren't going to do much good as far as being very presentable for sachets and such. However, I'm always torn between just wanting to leave the flowers in the garden for everyone to enjoy and to just add beauty to the atmosphere and uh, saving them and drying them and using them for future projects or to create beauty in the house, but you know, it's just something about leaving your flowers. I'm kind of stingy about it. I, I love to see them in the garden where they really are the happiest rather than picking them. Well, I decided to pick some after all. They will look lovely in a vase. I think I can still dry them too. Still have a wonderful scent. The subject of today's tea is a remarkable and accomplished woman and an American treasure, Tasha Tudor. Let's start out by making a few recipes out of her cookbook for today's tea.
I love what Tasha Tudor said about flower arranging. She said, I don't make proper flower arrangements. Mine just grow like the garden. <laughs> How true. I admit to feeling woefully inept at introducing our invisible guest today because she's a woman with a vast following who lived a unique and somewhat eccentric life, but there's so many facets to that life. And I'm sure that I won't be able to cover everything that I want to say about her in just a very short 15 minutes or so. So I'm going to try my best to put forth a few of the wonderful things that we know about Tasha Tudor. So please consider this video in the spirit in which it was intended, and that being an introduction and a celebration of Tasha Tudor. Successful author, storybook writer and illustrator, a mother, a homemaker, a marvelous cook, an exquisite gardener, and all the while living in 18th century life in a very unique fashion. I first learned about Tasha Tudor back in a magazine article way, way back in the 1980s, and there were these just absolutely stunning photographs of this frail a delicate looking woman trudging through the snow with a load of wood <laughs> in her shawl and boots and dressed in 18th century clothing. Further photographs revealed her cooking at a wood stove, baking bread, simmering a pot of stew, all under the delicate light of candles and lanterns in a rustic looking Cape Cod home which I later learned was hand-built by one of her sons. All these images and reading the story of her life stirred up in my mind romantic notions of a simpler life, but it was a life filled with hardship, hard work, but purpose and beauty. And myself, having always been a lover and a keeper of the past ever since I was a child, I was seriously drawn to this person and developed a great admiration for her. The bittersweet irony about discovering her as an adult is that I could have enjoyed her books immensely as a child because I really love the style in which she worked, which was an old-fashioned um, illustration style featuring cherubic children, beautiful heirloom, settings, animals, all the things that I love. But we never had any of Tasha Tudor's books, even though she w illustrated well over a hundred books. Tasha Tudor illustrated two of my favorite books, The Wind in the Willows and The Secret Garden, as well as many other books that she, she herself wrote. I will finish setting the table and then we will sit down and look at images and talk about the wonderful life and art and gardens of Tasha Tudor. Three, four, five guests, yes. Five guests. Our guests have arrived, as well as a busybody peacock in the back there who's always ready for a blueberry muffin especially a blueberry muffin from the Tasha Tudor cookbook. So we have a very simple feast today. I should say a very simple tea. We are having simply the blueberry muffins 
we are having still water iced tea. Oh, it is very good. And the fresh peaches from the tree this morning. I couldn't bear to cook these peaches. They just taste too good when they're fresh like this. Today's tableware is transferware. This particular pattern is Mason's Vista, made in England. And we don't have a lot of tableware today because we really don't need it, seeing as we're only having a small amount of food. But I do believe this is tableware Tasha Tudor would have approved of. I know she collected blue willowware, but I haven't got any of that, and I haven't got any lusterware. But she said you could never have enough china. I think this will suffice. We're also using an early 1900 Britanniaware teapot for our Earl Grey tea, and an early mid 19th century enamelware coffee pot for our Stillwater iced tea out of Tasha's cookbook. So let's talk about Tasha. You know, it's really difficult to zero in on a person's life, um, especially someone as famous and um, interesting as Tasha Tudor. So we're going to skip an awful lot because we don't have time to delve into everything. But I think the most important things, as far as I'm concerned, would be her artwork and her gardening and her lifestyle in a nutshell. If it's true that a picture is worth a thousand words, then I think the best way to introduce Tasha is to do it through her artwork and photographs of her life. She was born in 1915. And knew from a very early age that she wanted to illustrate storybooks. I'm not really going to focus on her childhood except for one thing that I think is sort of important and that was the fact that she always had a connection to the past. She said she was very insecure as a girl even though she's quite bold now she said and she was teased in school because she wore old-fashioned clothing. As a matter of fact her mother and her brother didn't like the fact that she wasn't interested in becoming a debutante in Boston society which is where they lived at the time and she would much rather work in her garden and milk her cow. At a young age, actually in her teenage years, she was very interested in vintage fashion, particularly from the 1830s. She began to acquire a collection of vintage outfits, which became quite extensive. She would actually adapt the patterns and also make her own clothing which was inspired by all the antique dresses and frocks, as she would call them, her frocks. And she would actually wear this clothing in a time period when I don't suppose that um, that was considered <laughs> very fashionable at all, <laughs> being as she was born in 1915 and as a teenager she would have been oh, about 1925, 1930. So she definitely stood out in the crowd as probably a little bit of an oddball. Tasha's first book was Pumpkin Moonshine. The eventual publishing of this book, which actually wasn't meant to be published, she actually wrote it for, I believe it was a niece of her husband. Um, it's a little bit like the story of Beatrix Potter. She didn't really intend for the tale of Peter Rabbit to be a story. It was a letter to a sick child. I talked about that in my video on Beatrix Potter. And then eventually it became a book. But it was because of Tasha's persistence. Uh, she said she traipsed the streets of New York trying to find a publisher and was turned down in every instance until eventually someone said yes. And she did a whole series called the Calico Books. Charming illustrations like these. Uh, I actually really like this style here. The style changed over the years, but I just love this very simple old look here. And it was from here that she actually got her start in the art world.
1938, she married a man, which she said later was not exactly a love match. She also confessed that she probably married him because she didn't think anyone else would have her. <laughs> it's very sad. It seems that Tasha pretty much supported the family with her artwork, which, in which she was becoming quite successful. She was publishing books, greeting cards, calendars, advent calendars at this time. She had four children, and they pretty much lived off of her art. Although the marriage survived long enough for them to have four children, eventually it was broken up because it appears that her husband was, I think, rather lazy. And it actually depended on Tasha to bring home the bacon. But he really didn't support the lifestyle that she liked. The lifestyle, the artistic vintage lifestyle that she was so enthralled with. With the publishing of two really successful books in the 1950s, Tasha finally came into her own as far as being able to let life imitate art because that's when her lifestyle became a reality for her. In other words, the financial success enabled her to create the life that she had imagined for herself. And what was that life? Well, her photographs tell it better than anything, I think. I think this is the Tasha Tudor that we all recognize. A frail but sturdy and tough woman, an artist, a creator, an animal lover, and a woman with a distinct and beautiful style. Vintage life, living a vintage life, living a life that she chose. One publication stated, the real point is not so much her art as the woman herself. And another reviewer said, she combines the fashion sense of Whistler's mother with the relentless industry of Martha Stewart. Another beautiful combination of fabrics. I just love that. <laughs> Whistler's mother. Here's a beautiful home that her son built her. And Tasha also became renowned for her absolutely stunning gardens. She once said about her leaner years when she really had to work so hard and raise those four children by herself and restore an old house. It wasn't an easy life. It was, it was tough. I think that's one of the things I actually have connection with her on this matter, because this was her quote. She said, those who like my illustrations say, you must be so enthralled with your creativity. That's nonsense. I'm a commercial artist. I've done my books because I needed to earn a living to keep the wool from the door and to buy more bulbs. <laughs> I love that. And you know, in a way I have a connection to that because as an artist myself, I became a single parent when my children were just three and eight. And I too lived off my art and my art alone for 10 years before I eventually remarried. So I understand that although obviously artists love to be able to do what they do, Sometimes people don't understand that you're doing it, it's your profession, and you're, you're doing it to make a living. It's not just a game. And obviously, it wasn't with Tasha. But even after she became very successful, she still continued doing art. Um, and I think she did her last book in the year 2002. And she was quite aged by then. She lived to be 93 and died in 2008. But I think her main love toward the end of her life were her absolutely magnificent gardens, and you can see why. So the woman herself, 
her lifestyle, her love for animals. She spun, she wove, she made goat cheese, she milked her goats twice a day. She had doves. But this magnificent garden, along with her art and a lifestyle of living in the 18th century, wearing beautiful old clothes. She must have been very stubborn. I never met her. I know people that did. Well, I wish I'd met her. I'm sure she would have been absolutely enchanting to talk to because she was very witty. I love another one of her quotes. She said, people look at me through a rose-colored lens. They don't realize I'm human. They don't want to see the real me. As Mark Twain said, we are like the moon. We all have our dark side that we never show to anybody. I think this can be seen in another one of her quotations where she was complaining about the voles, you know, the little rodents that get into your grasses and eat your flower bulbs and so on and so forth. She said of the little voles, I feed the voles x lax which does them in pretty well. <laughs> yes, I bet it did. Now, another thing that I took from Tasha Tudor was that she actually had um, what she called mice on ice. When I learned that Tasha Tudor kept dead creatures in a freezer in her basement, I thought, what a great idea. She called them mice on ice. She called it <laughs> the mouse morgue, and <laughs> she used them for art artistic purposes. Well, you know, one day my kitty Claudette, she's sitting right here right now, Claudette, Claudie, Claudie's quite the little huntress. One day Claudette brought a chipmunk home. <sighs> the poor little thing, well, it had already expired, of course, but she brought it home, and I got it away from her before she completely devoured it. And I thought, what the heck? I put it in a baggie, and I put it in the freezer. From that little chipmunk came various mice, little dead birds that I had found, and all manner of little creatures, which I put in baggies and marked, put them in the freezer, in the mudroom, and I was able to thaw them out when I needed a little art model, and it really did work. But I got that idea from Tasha Tudor. I never would have thought of such a thing. Of course, afterwards, I always gave him a proper burial. But that little chipmunk, <laughs> it was wonderful when I had to draw a chipmunk. Also, when I had to sculpt a chipmunk. And at one point, these were the bulbs Tasha was probably talking about. Another quote that I love from Tasha Tudor was, I enjoy doing the housework, ironing, washing, cooking, dishes. Whenever I get one of those questionnaires asking your profession, I always put down housewife. It's an admirable profession. Why apologize for it? You aren't stupid because you're a housewife. When you're stirring the jam, you can always read Shakespeare. Here she is in this wonderfully outfitted kitchen. the wood stove and all the beautiful copper and tin, cast iron, which often made appearances, almost always, in her illustrations, especially in her cookbooks. You can see this beautiful old-fashioned flavor. It just almost reminds me of Little House on the Prairie, but I guess it's Little House of Tasha's. So often you would see pantries and butter churns. <laughs> This was the life she lived. Beautiful borders with canned goods, and stoneware bowls, and baskets of eggs. I use a lot of these bits of equipment myself when I'm doing my cooking. She had over 30 corgis in her life, and they were often the subject of her art. In fact, entire books were dedicated to corgis. This is Corgiville.
known to rhapsodize about her corgis. She said, you should see my corgis at sunset in the snow. It's their finest hour. About five o'clock, they glow like copper. Then they come in and lie in front of the fire like a string of sausages. This artist did not limit herself to painting and illustration alone. She also was quite an accomplished doll maker. As you can see by these wonderful dolls right here. She made cloth dolls and animals. She also made wooden puppets. Those became white renowned as well. This is a mid-sized dollhouse. Not tiny miniatures. Anyone who loves miniatures would just be delighted with this. Look at all the wonderful things in there. Oh, there's a corgi. The Tudor family actually became known for their puppet shows. And also when she traveled the country giving lectures and making presentations, she would often display her skills as a puppeteer. The fact that she utilized the work of other artists in her doll making and costume making for the dolls and the furniture. As you can see in this little flyer here. This brings me to a very loose connection that I have to Tasha Tudor, not through myself, but through uh, two of my collectors who collect my critters, which is why they are our guests today. Because uh, my collectors actually did work with Tasha Tudor. Dave, the husband, carved many of her puppets from wood, and Beth, the wife, accompanied her on presentations. In fact, they have allowed me to use some of their photographs of personal art that they have from Tasha Tudor and displayed amongst her art are many of my little critters. So I actually feel very honored that some of my Hopalong Hollow folk are in the midst and in the company of Tasha Tudor's work as well. In today's world, it may not seem very unusual, the life that Tasha Tudor lived. Because nowadays, we have so many people that are homesteading, growing their own food. Homeschooling their children. And living a very self-sufficient life. And I think it's a fantastic movement, to be honest with you. But this, for her time period, she was a one of a kind. She definitely was a unique individual for this time. One of the only people doing this, one of the few people, I should say, that lived this kind of life. I hope I've been able to portray one of this century's most revered and beloved illustrators and lifestyle icons. And I hope I've done so with honesty and respect of course, time constraints keep me from going any further because there's so much more to say. But maybe sometime we can do a video simply on her gardens. So people all over the world have an affinity toward this remarkable woman for many reasons. Perhaps it's her gardens, her art, her ingenious way of creating an entire canvas as her way of life. I, I think for me it's all of the above, but most of all it's in her honoring of heritage, family history, self-sufficiency, creativity, but also in the very real proof that patience and hard work and persistence and determination are rewarded. Not always in financial ways, but in and of themselves as honorable qualities to have. So I say, let's have a cuppa in celebration of the life and beauty of Tasha.
Natasha Tudor. All that that represents. One last note, if it weren't for all these marvelous books with their fantastic information and photography, I never would have been able to do this video. So I will list all of these books and their authors in the introduction so that you can find them for yourself and you can learn a lot more than I was able to cover in these videos. So from Hopalong Hollow, this is Jerry. We'll see you next time. And by the way, Harney and Sons, Earl Grey Supreme Tea. Very strong and good. See you next time.